all of the students who were graduating had diabetic neuropathy already in their feet. What? Uh, At the age so of 18? Every, everybody in the school was walking super slow. Uh, and they actually changed the length of the, uh, of uh, they have to start later to give students time to be able to walk to school because uh, they take forever to walk. In the morning, it looks like zombies going to school. And then they have to t change the time from when the bell rings after class to when the next class starts. That has to be much longer because it takes longer for the students to be able to walk to the next class because their feet hurt so much in high school. Uh, because when you're looking at meat, it's like this is going to become me and it's going to give me the energy that I need. And when you're looking at a plant, it's like, well, this has something that's going to change the way I'm functioning. And so if you're sick, yeah. that's what you want. But if you're yeah. not sick, you don't want to have anything to do with it. Welcome to the Recovery and Transformation Podcast, the show that links personal health with societal well-being. I'm your host, Samir Dosani. I'm an activist, a PhD student, and a health coach based out of Johannesburg, South Africa. This show explores the root causes of disease and talks about how people are recovering and transforming every day. Welcome to another episode. My guest today is Joseph Pitawanaquat. Now, this was a really great conversation, and it basically took place in two parts. The first part of the conversation is about Joseph's journey of rediscovering his culture's traditional plant medicines and some of their applications. Joseph is particularly focused on working with those suffering from addiction, so we get into that in some detail. The second part of the discussion is about the use of meat-based diets uh, in reversing disease in some of the populations that Joseph works with in Ontario. If you like this discussion, please be sure to like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. With that, here's my discussion with Joseph Pitawanaquat. Mr. Joseph Pitawanaquat, it's a great pleasure to have you on the show, man. Wow, this is so cool. I'm pumped. I'm so excited. No, cool, man. Tell me, where are you, where are you, where are you talking from? Where are you at? I'm in, uh, right now, I'm in Peterborough, Ontario, in okay. Canada. But I'm okay. from Manitoulin Island, uh, uh, one of the biggest islands in Lake Huron. That's where I was born and raised. Cool. And and you are coming from the people who identify as Ashnabe or what? Yeah, yeah. I'm the Ashnabe, Jibwe. Awesome uh, stuff. Yeah. Awesome stuff, man. So tell us a little bit about your, your backstory. So so I know you're doing a ton of cool stuff and working with the community and and so on, but what what makes you what makes you do what you do? What what where do you where are you what's your background? I um I started to um well, really, I was just visiting with my grandma, <laughs> and then uh, I, I kind of um, was fascinating, fascinated with the idea that, uh, or the fact that she grew up and raised most of her kids like without a hospital or without a doctor. She used plants, <laughs> and I was always like, "Whoa, this is kind of crazy." So, but so I, I was, I thought I was just listening to crazy stories, uh, but I was actually learning, and. Uh, and then, you know, one day my wife says uh, that, you know, my grandma is kind of talking about medicine plants and like she's longing for them. She's like, we should go pick some for her so she could have these teas again. And so we started doing that. But then like small town stuff, everybody in the community started realizing, oh, Joe found this plant. And then they're knocking on my door, giving me pickles or something, <laughs> some kind of garden whatever they were growing and then they were get, getting medicine from me. So I was providing medicine, but then I really quickly started teaching about medicine uh, because I started to have experiences, you know, people were coming back a couple weeks later, a couple months later after I give them a plant and, and they were much better, you know, sometimes idiopathic conditions were ameliorated. And so I was like, this medicine stuff is like legit. It's, it's really helping. So, so then I started teaching in my community now we that quickly turned into teaching in hundreds of communities and institutions all over Ontario because I was so like well I was so fascinated at like how these plants are working, I started to try to figure out why. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I started researching, you know, plant chemistries and their physiological functions. Uh, and I had to learn a lot like about how the body works. Uh, and and uh, yeah, just learning how medicine worked taught me how 
our body works. And so I, I um, was able to provide the, you know, what, what little evidence there is, but like why the medicine is working. Yeah. And so, yeah, just teaching absolutely everywhere uh, for the past uh, 13 years, I guess that's pretty well all we've been doing. Um, that's cool stuff, man. So, so tell me if I go and say, I'm going to work with indigenous people and I'm going to take plant medicine. And I say that in like Hollywood, people are going to think I'm just going to be tripping for like 24 hours a day. <laughs> I, assume, yeah, totally. I assume that's not what you teach, or maybe it's part of what you teach, but it's not all that you teach. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we go out and we harvest like 250 different species of plants every year. Uh, and, and each one of these plants, it, different roots and barks and stems and flowers and leaves and seeds and everything, they're all used in all different ways. Um, to be able to, um, yeah, just basically extract the chemicals that are inside by making tea, and uh, it, and that those those chemicals will uh, have a certain physiological effect that will help restore normal function to a different organ system or process that your body has or goes through. So it's about healing different uh, issues, you know. So yeah. like, you know, we have a we have a whole bunch of different programs. They're all online now, but like, you know, childcare all of the medicines that are associated with childcare. You know, when you think about childcare, you think about like gastro, <laughs> you're going to want a plant that deals with gastro in 25 minutes, not, you know, riding it out for two weeks uh, and, you know, for toothaches and stuff like this. But, you know, we have women's health and uh, pain management, mental health and addictions programs. Like there's lots of medicine plant supports that help with so many different uh, components. I think the most relevant and important one is uh, is addictions. So I've been spending a lot of my time in the past, maybe like four years, really dedicated to uh, addictions because because with most other chronic disease things, um, but really just kind of end up looking at nutrition stuff <laughs> as being uh, yeah. a, pr a proper. You know, you want to get somebody to baseline. You get them on a proper nutritional protocol. Um, and then it, their idiopathic chronic disease symptoms are manageable at just, just the process of getting to baseline. They don't even need an inter uh, like a medical intervention. Uh, they just needed to eat a little bit different well, or a like lot a of it different. Yeah. yeah. Just like a, just like eat like a regular person did not that long ago and yeah. things seem to resolve. So, we'll, but we'll get to that. Though, yeah. We'll get to that in a yeah. second. So, so tell me a little bit more about addiction. So, so you're finding that these plant medicines can really make a huge difference when it comes to someone who's been struggling with addiction. Yeah, yeah, massive. Uh, like, so we do a lot of work with uh, nicotine addiction. <laughs> that one's really fun. Uh, we have uh, online programs that we 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 run in maybe maybe like five or six different communities, uh, um, may, maybe per month, um, and. Yeah, it's just, it's so simple. Like there's a plant and that plant is called Lobelia and Lobelia species occur all around the world. And in the Great Lakes, we have a species called Calms Lobelia, Lobelia Kami. And it is like, the is by far the strongest of them all. Strongest meaning has the most lobuline. Lobuline is a chemical that fits inside of the nicotine receptor, but it has a half-life of two weeks. Wow. So it, 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 it satisfies the physical addiction to nicotine. Um, for two uh, almost weeks. immediately yeah. yeah and so you could get somebody to smoke a little bit of the lobelia um, which we do in our programs we send little packages so everybody gets to try and uh there's absolutely you go from chain smoking um like every 25 minutes getting up throughout the night like really really heavily addicted to nicotine and um there's absolutely no craving for you know between 20 and 36 hours Jeez, and so it's amazing yeah so like it works so good and I always like throwing NRT under the bus, like nicotine replacement therapy, because they're always uh, advertising like 50 to 60% success rate. And it, it doesn't even take a statistician, but like uh, to look at the studies and see they're presenting to all of us uh, uh, relative risk reduction values. Uh, and if you read the study and decipher the absolute risk reduction values of using nicotine replacement therapy is between two and 3%. So it's like, What's sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you can you explain that again? So if you know what you're saying is that if I have a hundred people, and yeah. say um, twenty of them are addicted to nicotine, mm -hmm. so what you're saying is it takes the the number down from twenty to nineteen or eighteen is, is traditional NRT. Is that what it is? 
Uh, well, it, it would be out of 100 people who are addicted to nicotine, mm. it would take two or three off of, you know, it would help. And for people who, for smokers who quit cold turkey, um, that can be in different areas with different demographics. It One can two. be up to... Th- it could be up to 13%. If you just cold turkey cigarettes right now, it's way more yeah. successful than that's NRT. Fair. That's how I did it back in the day, man. Yeah, um, yeah, you're you're one of the 13%. <laughs> yeah, well. Okay, so I'm with you. So so in other words, they're saying the, NR, the, 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 the relative risk is it's versus cold turkey. Cold turkey is 13% and with NRT, it's 15% or something like that. Yeah, with NRT, it's uh, 2%. Two percent more than thirteen, whatever it is. Yeah. No, no, it's two percent in total. Oh no, it's even worse than I thought. This is it's terrible, and I can't believe. Okay, so like with the nicotine, I I get groups of of people. A community will invite me in. We'll engage in this in the lobelia shkodeobugunis. We call it our our plant medicine. And out of all of the chain smokers that are there, we've worked with groups seventy people plus. Um, everyone completely stops smoking like cannot smoke a cigarette for like sometimes 30 hours wow. uh, and then a little bit more lobelia a little bit more of that plant medicine their cravings can be like uh it can take like another week for them to feel another craving and if your nicotine cravings are a week apart you're in control and you're in control with that plant and so eventually it's very easy just to uh, just kick it completely. Yeah, out. I mean, so, there might be a psychological element to the addiction left, but there's no physical addiction if you can go without mm-hmm, it for a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so we try to satisfy that too with uh, uh, the habitual addiction. So there's lots of medicines, medicine plants that, you know, when, you know when you're sick, and you're trying to cough, but nothing comes out. Well, there's some plants that you could burn, like just a little bit, Not you don't want to look like a bingo hall. You just like just a little bit of smoke in the air and it just tickles all of it out. Your coughs become so effective. Uh, so for a smoker who has the uh, um, the habitual addiction component, there's some medicines that can be smoked that will help to clean out the lungs, uh, uh, at least in the initial stages, to help satisfy that. You know, some of the oral fixation stuff too. This is amazing uh, stuff. So, so how many people do you say in your community actually know about these plants and, and know as much as you do, you do or more? In in my community, it's pretty common. It was it was pretty easy for me to uh, find this knowledge, like with my grandma. But then also like seeing that you know it was kind of like there there was this thing you know maybe before the whole the impacts of colonization and and all of the things that happened to our people. Um, my grandma grew up knowing that by the time she's like twelve or thirteen years old. Uh, when she's um, old enough to then, you know, 15 to 18 years old, starting a family, um, by the time you're 12, you should already know enough to basically be your own physician. It was common knowledge. Like if you're hungry, you got to know how to cook so you don't starve. And if your clothes start to rip, you got to know how to sew it back up so the rip doesn't get bigger. So you probably only have one set of clothes. And if you get sick or injured, you have to know what kind of plants you, you use because like you're not going to make the three day horse and wagon ride to the hospital. Like you have to know your plants. And so does common knowledge. And for the most part, most of my community, I would say, has a really, really remarkable uh, retention of that knowledge. It's different in other communities. <laughs> Some absolutely none. Uh, most, I would say, absolutely none. Uh, but I come from a really, really lucky, uh, culturally retensive community, I would think. That's fantastic stuff, man. And and so are there other addictions we can talk about? So maybe maybe alcohol, I know, would be, I mean, maybe that's something to talk about. Alcohol, I don't, uh, we don't really have too much supports for alcohol addiction. Um, with this, we usually facilitate a, like a really incredible conversation um, around psychedelics and psychedelic therapy. Um, this is a really, really incredible process. Uh, but for plant medicines, we don't really have too much. We have a, we have one, uh, root that um, uh, is somewhat similar to naltrexone. Naltrexone is a drug, uh, I think it's like a GLP-1 agonist that's used for obesity, uh, but it also has a, a, a devastating effect on alcoholism. People just forget that that they want to drink. It's, uh, most physicians or, or, or brain doctors will call that uh, 
the oops i forgot drug <laughs> like oops i forgot i was i'm a drinker <laughs> and it's just and so um we work with the doctors uh to be um um so so that they understand you know some of the secondary or tertiary benefits of naltrexone and maybe um are a little bit more uh um liberal with with, with that one I mean, yeah. there's consequences to it too, but for uh, sure. yeah, that conversation always ends up looking mainly at psychedelic therapy for alcoholism. Um, my favorite though is, is opiates for sure. We we have some really, really amazing medicines that uh, uh, we use for opiate addiction um, in clinical settings for the past 10 years. We have these roots from a plant called, uh, we call it Nadwanak. Uh, but it's um, wood betony or, or pediculus canadensis is the Latin name. And it's completely not studied. Um, I kind of stumbled across this uh, this use on my own. Um, my grandma just said that it helps calm you down so you can make your own decision. And so when I had some friends and family who were um, uh, opiate addicts and they wanted help, I was like, the only one that I think could probably help you would be this one. And they uh, had the most incredible experience. So I was like, but then I started working with treatment centers all over Ontario, um, uh, um, doing almost like little experiments. But people who are on 80, 100, 125 units of uh, methadone or suboxone, like the opiate replacement therapy, um, they they, they could cold turkey, withdrawal symptom free, no questions asked. They never have to look back. That's Uh, amazing. That's where I've been spending most of my time and energy and all of my efforts. These are the most remarkable stories I that I yeah. cannot get enough of. Yeah. So is Canada as affected by the opiate crisis uh, as as the U.S. is, or not quite as bad? Or it's it's pretty bad. I mean, it's a declared crisis. I don't know, like if one is worse than the other, but it's it's pretty incredible. Wow, wow, this is great stuff, man. Um, anything else you want to mention in terms of like the most amazing sort of plant medicine turnarounds you've seen before we move on to nutrition? Oh, no. I mean, we see lots of lots of really cool stuff. I mean, uh, I just like it when when folks have the opportunity to hear that there is so much support out there. Um, and yeah, you know, it's exogenous chemicals that we're having that accomplish this. Um, and in that sense, it's not much different than Western medication. Uh, you know, a plant might not be... Um, you know, one chemical trying to do something, it, you know, it can be 150 different things that are all working in a synergy. So, you know, one might be more uh, uh, um, uh, successful in a healing experience than the other. Uh, but um, yeah, there's a lot of supports out there. Um, and, you know, I think that humans are designed to be in constant communication with the land that we're living on. Uh, and a lot of that communication comes from engaging in plant medicines uh, to, you know, correct certain things. Every time you get injured, every time you get sick. Um, well, this is funny, you know, like with infections, like a like a viral infection or something like this. There's no medicine that helps boost your immune system or there's no medicine that that helps you uh, like to kill viruses, at least in my part of the world. Um, instead, what our medicines all do, like when we get sick. The, the plants that we choose are all helping your kidneys. They're helping your cardiovascular system. They're helping your lungs. Uh, they're, they're helping with, uh, you know, restoring the enzymatic functions like COX uh, inhibitors that COX enzymes that go out of whack when we're fighting off a virus. This is all like recovery from. It's to minimize the damage that is incurred while you are sick. It's not to help you get better. Uh, to to be able to successfully fight off the pathogen, it's to reduce the amount of incurred damage. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that that constant communication between humans and and the lands that we occupy is super necessary for us to be able to. I think that every part of the world has a has a really incredible life that the land is able to provide the people that live there. Um, and the knowledge of being able to access all of that plant medicines gets you closer to living that life, which I think most indigenous groups around the world will call a good life. For sure. Um, For sure. Yeah. 
So if you don't mind, if I could share a story from when I was in the community here. So we have a community called, technically they're called the Komani Sand community here in Southern Africa, but but they refer to themselves as Sake people, S-A-A-K-E. So that's the term I use. Um, and you go and you visit the, the houses and, and we're told, you know, we as like academics, outsiders, we're told these are not people who uh, grow anything. They don't have the talent of farming, right? They're sort of hunter-gatherer people. But you go and you see that they all have little like greenhouses or they have like a patch of land um, or like some, like it, we would call it a vegetable garden, but they're not growing vegetables. They're growing um, hudia, which is a certain kind of a, a drug that's become really popular for weight loss <laughs> because it's something that um, the boys will take uh, and then they'll go out and fast for like, it, it's a, it's a, it's a ritual that the, the boys do around the age of 12 or 13 and they go out, they take this and then they fast, they spend three or four days in the in the in the wilderness with usually with one or two older men as well um so because it, it takes away the hunger so it's become popular as a diet drug which is i think a, a bit of a travesty um and they have things like um you know marijuana and so on that they use for medicinal purposes so there's no there's no concept and when i was like pushing those guys on like what do they eat yeah they eat like potatoes and tubers and that kind of stuff but only if there's no other option and only in, in a certain type of time of year when it's not advisable to go out and make a kill. Um, otherwise, for them, food is synonymous with meat. Um, mm -hmm. Is that is that the case in your culture as well? Or, or what, what does that look like? I think, uh, well, I think with, with us, um, I've been trying to figure this out for, for the past few years, um, uh, just kind of like from a cultural perspective. And I think it's really funny to... to um, to um we have this story it's a migration story where we were all living in a place where everything was normal everything was given to us everything was easy um and then there was a catastrophe that happens um and that that catastrophe was that our uh uh, food supply is starting to run out. And so we have this migration story of um, where we're migrating from this paradise place uh, where we have everything that we need and we have to migrate to where um, we switch food sources to where the way that we describe it is that where food grows on the water. Um, and in the interior of the Great Lakes, you have um, all of the beds of wild rice. Um, and so um, wild rice was a huge uh, savior for us um, is the way that we describe it. And we honor this plant so much every year. We have ceremonies around it uh, or it is included in every uh, important ceremony that we have. It's like we're always remembering what wild rice did for us, like it saved us. And I'm always uh, entertaining some really amazing conversations with our leadership, our spiritual leaderships and the people who carry these stories about um about uh, the possibilities, I guess, of this migration story or this this uh, cataclysm that happened being the extinction of the megafauna. Yeah, um, that's an you know, we start idea. to yeah, we start to lose our food source, and so we have to find or we're led to, we're guided to where food grows on the water. So we're switching from uh, our fat sources of uh, nutrition to um, including a lot more carbohydrate with that. I mean, that's uh, my but... hypothesis. That's my working hypothesis, not just for for um, one community, but for all the communities that eat a lot of carbohydrates, because we know that no one did before those extinctions, right? So, yeah. So the hypothesis is that those extinctions were a sort of um, push force towards what's called a Neolithic revolution. Yeah? But I, I, I don't like that term. But, you know, the shift towards like farming and, and eventually cities yeah. and so on. It wasn't yeah. so much... The way it's taught in the history books is, you know, everyone wanted to like be Rome. So naturally they started to become Rome. That's clearly not what happened, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's far more complicated than that. And I think the extinction of the megafauna led to migration north for those people who um, still wanted to hunt animals that had a lot of fat. Mm -hmm. um, you know this, but I just want to tell our, our, our viewers that um, humans can't eat more than 30 40 percent of our calories from protein otherwise we get get something called rapid starvation right so you need the majority of your calories to or your energy rather to come from carbohydrates or fat or some combination of that um and when you're you know those big animals are no longer around you're left hunting the lean uh leaner animals you can't get enough fat so you have to include some carbohydrates 
if you're going to stay close to the uh, equator or even the temperate zones. But there are communities that moved up north, started hunting the whale, et cetera, et cetera. And th that was another way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. That's my thought mm -hmm. at least. I don't have enough. I don't really yeah, have for sure. Yeah. I like looking at, at our, our language too. Um, our language is, is, uh, is really fun. We have like this phenomenon in our language where every sound has a, has a meaning or every sound is like, Every sound is a verb. Every sound does something. And depending on that sound's placement in the word um, will determine its action. And uh, we have really, um, uh, it's really kind of cool. So like just looking at the way that we describe meat, we say we us. Um, and we is, uh, you know, it's like a prefix that is describing something that is going to be uh, something that will be something that wants to be um, and we ya that ya portion is talking about a resemblance of uh, um, or or the state of being um, and so when you say we us um, it's talking about the thing that is gonna become uh, us become you yeah <laughs> wow man that's and, amazing and uh, for fat we'll say um, uh a bimide is fat. Uh, sometimes we'll shorten it and say mide, uh, but a bimide is the way that we describe fat. And that one's really fun too, because uh, bime is talking about something that's like going along, uh, something that's going by, something that's moving fast to you. It's on the way, like it's a fleeting uh, thing. And I always like to think about a bimide as being... Um, uh, just a, like a definition, a working definition of energy, like the capacity to do work uh, and work being the the move or cause to move or gradually or with difficulty into another position. So it's just something that's going by just exactly what we say. a uh, And so like energy and work, the capacity to do work and then the definition of work being um, the movement or cause to move from one position to the next this is such um, fascinating stuff man is are you guys writing books about this or something like how can i learn about all this traditional knowledge man uh i'm trying <laughs> my uh uh yeah i'm i'm, I'm trying to get it out there and i've been trying uh, so right now i'm in conversations uh um with different language experts and leaders my, my mom included like just having conversations about the way that we define food uh because uh like um um plants are we're just we're, we're it's not such a fantastical definition as meat and fat would be uh plants is uh is like wash or wash and it's just describing the way that the plant looks like it's coming out of the ground and and it, and and uh it's just a physical definition of what is what yeah. what, what you're seeing sprouting um, maybe yeah yeah kind of like sprouting mm -hmm. yeah but uh and, and uh and then also too like wash what the word for plant is describing is a is a change um onch is a change and so wash that's describing a change that happens and so there's already in the word built in and understanding that that plant uh, is going to cause a change to occur. And I think that it's talking about the medicinal changes uh, because when you're looking at meat, it's like, this is going to become me and it's going to give me the energy that I need. And when you're looking at a plant, it's like, well, this has something that's going to change the way I'm functioning. And so if you're sick, yeah. that's what you want. But if you're yeah. not sick, you don't want to have anything to do with it. No, man, this is totally amazing stuff. So I, I want if you don't mind, I want to pivot a little bit to talk a little bit. So, so I've seen some of your videos on, on diabetes and nutrition and so on. And so my first question is, is, is there a problem with diabetes in, in, the, in Canada and in your community or in general? I assume there is. Yeah, yeah, it's brutal. Uh, that is definitely, it's the number, it's the second most common disease to affect uh, First Nations people in Canada. And what's the first? Um, is diabetes arthritis is the first okay and i think the arthritis is a is a consequence of the diabetes so the, um you know it's a it's a really common comorbidity and in, with indigenous people um, i mean when i changed my diet my i thought i had arthritis in my knees but it, it went away when i changed my diet and now i don't even yeah. remember what knee used to hurt like it's weird 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, diabetes is crazy. And obesity, I've worked in some communities where the uh, for every student, this has been for the last 10 years, every student who has graduated from um, the this high school had um, both type 2 diabetes and were morbidly obese. I don't think they technically use the term morbidly obese anymore, but they did when I went to the community. Wow. And so it was 100% of indigenous students who graduate from the school. Sorry, sorry. We're talking about 18-year-old kids, 18 boys and years girls. Old. Yeah. And, and in my experience with that community, so I was there to work with the kids in the school. So what I did was uh, teach, because like all of the students who were graduating had diabetic neuropathy already in their feet. What? Uh, At the age so of 18? Every, Everybody in the school was walking super slow, uh, and they actually changed the length of the uh, of uh, they have to start later to give students time to be able to walk to school because uh, they take forever to walk. In the morning, it looks like zombies going to school, and then they have to t change the time from when the bell rings after class to when the next class starts. That has to be much longer because it takes longer for the students to be able to walk to the next class because their feet hurt so much in high school what the hell is going on here man what's your what's your prognosis why is that happening to that particular community uh i i think well i mean you it's, have these um i'm sure, talking about like coca-cola and the, the usual cost culprits or something else it's actually really simple so in these communities in the north um they don't have roads they they have their fly-in communities uh so they're very very remote uh but also too um the the whole lifestyle like 30 years ago or 35 years ago if you went to these communities um there you you would be hard pressed to even find a snow machine like everybody walked everybody was active everybody hunted everybody trapped everybody fished that's where you got all of the food that you needed and and in my conversations yeah it was it, they were like well, almost exclusively carnivorous you know they have some berries seasonal access to berries uh, and seasonal access to wild rice. But the amount of work, they just say, oh, I'll just wait until the geese come. Like when the geese come, <laughs> I could get a hundred of these in a day. And, you know, it's like way easier. So um, they had this mindset. And what happens is uh, um, the Northern store, which is like a, like a Walmart, I guess it's actually owned by Walmart, but um, they go and drop this big store into the community and they were like, this is where you get food now. Uh, and everything in that store, uh, it's it. Uh, they don't know how to cook it. You go into those communities now, they're like, I don't know what an avocado is. It's subsidized. If you buy avocados and vegetables and fruits, they're subsidized. So they cost less, but no one knows how to eat them. They're like, what are these fruits and these leaves? You just eat them? Like, I don't know how to prepare this. And and uh, and so what they go to in the store is um, um, English is really bad in some of these communities, too. Like they have a hard time with English, but they all know heat and serve because all you have to do is just heat it up and then eat it. And, and, and the microwave food. or something. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't have microwaves, but they, they'll just like put it on the in front of the fire, the fire. Or, or like on top of the stove. And, and then it's just heat and serve. And, uh, and, and that's it. So all their food went from like moose and caribou and, and, and geese and, and fish and like all of these things to heat and serve. And that's wow. it. And wow. they don't, they don't move. They don't leave their rooms. Um, well, they it's not easy to move if it's minus 30 or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they don't have their traditional clothing anymore. Um, so yeah, it's hard to leave the house you, uh, because like, if you need to leave the house, you know how expensive it is to get a half decent jacket that, you know, to get a good Canada goose jacket, it's going to be, wow. you know, 15, 1800 bucks. Wow. You're man. not going to, you're not going to buy that. You got sweaters and, and like real cheap jackets. You're not going to go outside. You're going to stay must be, But there must be people who still know how to make the traditional clothing out of caribou skin or whatever it was. Yeah. Do they ever? And man, some, sometimes I get the most incredible gifts for visiting these communities. It's a very customary to give gifts, uh, as like to accomplish a transaction. Um, and, uh, yeah, I get some really, there's some artisans up there that just make the most incredible material. 
And then even just to contextualize that too, like you think of the life that they're living now, they learned how to train dogs to domesticate and then tra- mm-hmm. domesticate wolves and then train the dogs so that they're much more accomplished trappers. Um, and so this was, this was, a, a, this was brought on because of the stress. We used to have a beaver that was like the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, uh, a, a, a massive, massive beaver. It was megafauna. Um, and the, the, they remember this, this, these giant animals. It was much easier back then, you know, and, and they, they have an understanding in their communities that's like, you know, something happened and all of the animals are real small now. And you have to be real smart to be able to know how to get them. So we, so we have dogs um, to, that they really help with the process. Mm-hmm. That's why it was one of the biggest colonial efforts uh, uh, to uh, where, where's the, the uh, what do you call it? Dog culling? Where they just killed all of the dogs because we relied mm-hmm. on them so much. They said, if we kill all the dogs, they'll be completely dependent on us. And then we'll put a northern store there and then, and then it, to increase their dependency. Uh, and so it's very clever, I guess, everything that happened. But uh, it's fun to go back and say, no, you guys had it right with the geese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that in a second. But but a couple of things I want to just clear up first. So, <clears throat> yeah, this idea of the European co- colonialists, like killing off the dogs, something similar happened here. They, they didn't allow people, even even the communities I work with, like they're allowed to go into the you know the national park or whatever where the which is their traditional land that they were kicked off of they had to yeah. lobby to get back access to it but they're not allowed to and they're allowed to hunt but they're not allowed to hunt with their dogs and they're like dude we've been hunting with our dogs for like since forever like you know what's the big deal but in a way that has its advantages because it teaches you different skills um mm-hmm. and it teaches you to be a really good tracker and so on and these people are amazing trackers there were, you know, the South African military wanted to hire them because they were such good trackers. Um, but it has a downside too because you're never going to catch enough that you can be self-sufficient without the dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a shame. The same thing happened here. We had we had some people. Commu- this is within living memory. Like there's people in my community right now who hunted the same area where they learned how to hunt and bring back a moose you know you have enough meat for from a moose to eat for an entire year and it was, it was a simple you go in the fall you get your moose everything is okay <laughs> and uh now then it turned into a provincial park and then so they went to their same spot to go get their moose they bring it back home they get arrested <laughs> no same wild no, I mean, I, I, there was a similar story, which I'm not actually at liberty to tell, but but I have similar stories I could I could tell you. Um, yeah. Then I just wanted to define things because um, most of my, a, a lot of my viewers and listeners are coming from Asia and, and India in particular, and, and they will think that wild rice is a variety of rice, but it's not. So, so could you just explain what wild rice is? Yeah, it's a type of grass uh, that has really, really big seeds. <laughs> and uh, we have a whole... Um, you know, people will call it ceremony, but we have this whole process to preparing the wild rice from harvesting it to um, uh, letting it dry to taking off the chaff uh, and then and the the heat treatments and the time of year that it's done. Um, in essence, it's entirely a detoxification process <laughs> uh, just to make sure it's causing the least amount of harm as possible. And, and the, there's a grade of wild rice that we have this this type of grass and it grows in the wetland too so it's actually a pretty romantic experience to take a canoe out and you're traveling through wild rice when you're paddling the wild rice is taller than you and as you paddle um there's a the somebody sitting in the front who has two long skinny poles and they pull the grass in with one pole and then hit it with the other and all the grass falls into the into the canoe wait until your canoe is full and then then you have work to do. <laughs> um, this is real cool. There's real cool stories of people. There's this bird. It's called a passenger pigeon. It it used to like uh, fly in flocks of of hundreds of thousands of of pigeons, and it would block the sky. There would be this massive rivers of birds in the sky, and it, when they saw you winnowing rice, they would be dive bombing to get at the rice that you just you picked for them. And so it is really common to um, know that this was going to happen. And, and there's games that you would train kids to be able to 
catch as many of the pigeons because they're pretty big. They they weren't like a city small pigeon. They they're like big, um, almost like a like the size of a small chicken, I guess, uh, and but far less meat on them than a chicken, but decent enough that yeah. if you get forty of them, you get kids uh to get you know 40 of them in a day you got a pretty solid soup um but oh, uh, sure. wild rice yeah it's a really romantic harvest i uh even you know not eating any plant materials for years now it's still uh it's still something that i take time out of my year to be a part of for sure it's a it's a tradition and it's part of the culture but i i think you know by the time you were growing up or maybe even i was growing up that a lot of that culture was lost and people were eating bread and rice and seed oils and so on yeah. um and that led to what it's led to and so you're saying there's a big epidemic of obesity all over in native communities in particular but all over ontario i imagine as well um yeah and um, what is your so? Did you go straight to carnivore? Or did you experiment with different things? How did you How did you come to be an advocate of this this way of eating? Kind of happened on accident. I was, I was working with a woman who is uh, um, this is um, this is quite a while ago, maybe like nine, ten years ago. I didn't have, I didn't even have my daughter yet, but um, there was this girl. She sent me a face a message on our Facebook page. Um, and she said, uh, can you help? Do you have medicine for my son? She had a picture of her nine month old son and he had eczema, like head to toe and just cracked skin, bleeding everywhere. Um, and it, it was, it was like, it was terrible, such a terrible picture. And I was like, oh man, uh, she, um, we don't really have medicine for eczema, but being a sufferer of eczema myself, I said, I know it's usually driven by diet. If we could find out one, what is causing the eczema, uh, in some people it's dairy, you know, it's been wheat. I got one kid, we did an elimination diet. We realized it was only cashews that was causing his whole eczema reaction. Well, maybe not causing, but if we remove the cashews, he was better. Was so yeah, was better. that okay. was it. So I said, let's do an elimination diet. And I said, you know, eliminate wheat for two weeks. See if it goes away. If it doesn't, then we'll do like uh, we'll, we'll do soy, and then we'll do nuts, and then we'll do, and then and then if we find out it's a nut, we'll have to figure out which nut it is. So then we'll eliminate almonds for two weeks, and then peanuts for two weeks, and then cashews for, and then I was like, man, by the time your son is done high school, maybe we'll have it figured out. I was like, this is such a stupid idea. So I said, how about you just eliminate everything, see nothing but just steak and eggs for a couple of days um and and uh and because he was exclusively breastfeeding and so i said you just eat steak and eggs for a couple of days um and uh and then we'll we'll see what happens kind of like reverse engineer an elimination diet and she was like she was down she was like anything that, that can help she hasn't slept in days she was so desperate I so imagine. yeah she she goes steak and eggs Three days later, she sends a picture of her son. Everything is gone. Can't even tell he ever had eczema. Big smile on his face. So I was like, okay, this is great. Keep going. And she said, I have something else to tell you. Uh, she's like, number one, I feel like the best I've ever felt in my life. But number two, I was a raging alcoholic three days ago. She's like, when I eat this, um, uh, when I'm eating this way, I, 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 can't drink like I went from 18 to 25 drinks a night to now like I had three the first night two and then she was like I didn't even want to drink last night I didn't drink anything so I was like oh interesting and she was like and I'm not missing something like without fruits and vegetables and then I was like you know what not, I, let's, I could let's find out yeah, I could read the nutritional, we have a book, I grew up, my mom is a nurse, so I'd always read this prescription for nutritional healing textbook. Hers was like green, it was like first edition. Oh, I know <laughs> the one, I, I had the yeah, same. Yeah, you probably know exactly what's on top For nutritional healing, yeah, I got the same one. Yeah, uh, bulk, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I got the orange one now and I was like, is she going to be missing nutrients? Because in every nutrient that's inside of that book, the primary source is always an animal product. Um, and then the secondary source is can be from plants. So it doesn't seem like she's going to be missing anything, maybe fiber, maybe vitamin C, but meat has vitamin C. So I was like, quick little Google search. And I was like, you know what, there's no eczema. So I don't think there's going to be anything really dramatic. 
And so like, obviously I didn't want to cause any harm. So I was researching it a little bit more realized that, yeah, this is pretty well what we've done through a four and a half million year development for our species. And it's everything for 350,000 years we've existed in this form. That's what we did. So I was like, I don't, I think you're fine. And then, but it got really crazy because I was thinking that maybe it's just like a nutritionally satisfied person that has less of a hole to fill when it comes to alcoholism. So when I was working with doing these addictions programming, so that's my favorite with medicine, uh, I had groups of alcoholics who were like, is there anything for me? And I was like, well, you know, you could just like, just tick, start ticking off some boxes. Just let's just make sure you have all of the nutritional requirements that you need um, and, and just start eating more meat um, or, you know, like what this girl did. And so I explained to her and explained the nutritional requirement component, like just steak and eggs a couple days and, and eat a lot, like really fill those stores. And that was able to control alcoholism to such a massive degree, uh, almost completely. And so um, uh, some of those alcoholics were diabetics, so obese diabetics. Uh, and when they started to eat this way, um, their diabetes was gone. And so I was like, what do you mean? I hear, what do you mean gone? They were like, yeah, I got the blood test, the HbA1cs. Uh, and I went from 18 to 4.5 in the last three months, or I went from 25, an A1C of 25 to 4.5 in three months. So I was like, your diabetes is gone. And then we started getting people with CGMs, uh, back when CGMs were first, uh, coming out, um, they would have, uh, um, yeah, you'd be able to see the next day, their sugar is just like, boom, stable, rock solid goes from six, five. 4.5 rock solid 4.5 for months as long as they're doing this you know um and the feeling that they have uh, of course the weight loss experiences that go along with that as well um that's how i kind of stumbled across this thing i was like well frick, we we could get rid of diabetes just like and then you, really simply like yeah the human requirement for carbohydrates is zero and 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 uh, there's very few realizations that we need that 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 you need to be able to understand. You don't need one carbohydrate ever for an, for your entire life. Yeah. You know, maybe when you're a kid with breast milk, but um, after you're done growing, yeah, you know, you know, you don't have any need for it. And so let's get rid of it. And when yeah. you get rid of it, the diabetes is gone, the obesity is gone, yeah. and in a lot of other people, the alcoholism was gone. And so I kind of stumbled across it and, and I, I honestly tried for, you know, the, for, for maybe like a good four to six years to prove myself wrong. Cause it doesn't make any sense to not eat fruits and vegetables. It sounds like the stupidest thing in the world, even on the Incredibles. Remember on the Incredibles, that movie, that guy's holding up that car, that kid busted him looking at him holding up that car. And that kid was like looking at this big, strong man. And then that's what he said. Eat your fruits and vegetables. That's when I knew. I was like, this is a lie. You don't, you don't, this has, fruits and vegetables have nothing to do with anything. So then I really started to um, get into it, make, make it primary. Yeah. Like a big part of our teachings started to get lots of experiences of people with not just diabetes, but their psoriasis and um, asthmas. And then of course, eczema and like all of the common things that that i deal with i'm trying to tell everybody medicine is good yeah. but you know doing doing this is much better do you find that this approach is is more difficult for people to adhere to than like a, like a low carb approach that might include some vegetables and berries or whatever or you find this is easier or same or what do you think I, it's definitely easier than like a low carb or a ketogenic type of approach for sure and why do you um, think that is I think because the uh, um, there is no negative consequence. I think ketogenic diets have a have a negative consequence associated with them with hormone function, especially when you get not even long term, but like three weeks in, uh, your um, electrolyte balance tanks and you feel that everywhere. Uh, and you're unless you're just like really keen on just hacking electrolytes all the time and it's and you're so super focused and obsessed but still man every morning you're going to stretch and you're going to get a cramp and you're going to complain and people can't handle 
they know something is wrong. And then long-term uh, ketogenic diet, we always have hormone issues. Um, and, yeah. uh, and so it was always, always much easier for people just to, just to go all in. I mean, ease yeah. into the carnivore diet, of course, but once they're in the feeling that they have, the, they could stretch in the morning and, and curl their toes in a real solid morning stretch and it doesn't get stuck. Yeah. Um, and hormone balance, of course. Um, but you might not lose as much weight as quickly in a carnivore diet, but, um, or, or a strict carnivore diet. Um, relative to a ketogenic diet. Um, so people often complain about that, but I think the, the joy or beauty of a carnivore diet is you're, you're keeping your BMR, uh, like sky high, like yeah. you're, that's you're the basal, basal metabolic rate. Yeah. Your basal metabolic rate is just rocking. Uh, cause I think, you know, a ketogenic diet and, you know, limitations associated with it, uh, can lower the BMR. And so, you know, if you do fall off the wagon, those, those, co the consequences are much bigger than when your BMR is like sky high. Cause I had so many people this summer, we have a carnivore support group, uh, and, and, uh, people were like, man, I fell off the wagon so hard. I feel so bad. Uh, but yeah, it was fairly inconsequential. You know, a lot of people just like had a rock and end the summer and, uh, didn't really, put back on a lot of weight, didn't have too much consequences, jumping back into it. You know, when the school year began, everybody got that rigidity back and, and yeah, back on the wagon and cool stuff, man. Cool stuff. Um, do you guys have, do you have any thoughts on like the, the, the raw versus like, like I just tell you my own story. Like I, I introduced raw eggs a couple of months ago and I feel a lot better. I feel like all my remaining cravings have kind of gone away, feel more relaxed. Um, mm -hmm. Just an anecdote, but I don't know. Do you guys use raw foods at all? Uh, yeah, for sure. I think a lot of our meat um, historically or traditionally was 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 mostly raw. I, I mean, it was dried. I, I do this thing multiple months out of the year where I, uh, um, especially when I'm given wild meat, it's hard with things that are farmed because they're so fatty. Wild meat is a lot more lean and it's super easy to dry. Just like slice it up into thin strips, dehydrate it. I could dehydrate, you know, in a couple of days, I could dehydrate, you know, 80 pounds of meat down to like 20, like it, 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 and then you, and we grind it up. And, and so when it's all, when the meat is dried and ground, it's totally stable. Like it's not going to um, go rotten. It's not going to lose its nutrition or anything like this. It's just, it's just there. And we also uh, render fat and then reconstitute that meat with fat. Uh, yeah. just enough so that we could make like little cakes and yeah. so you have all the protein you have all the fat that you need and you could have different ratios of it in my fridge i always have these pucks we call it or a lot of people will call it pemmican yes um some people will mix berries and things in there but i just you know just meat and fat for me yeah, yeah. oh and i get marrow fat oh and you That's render marrow fat and and mix it with the dried powdered meat fluff it just condenses into these perfect pucks that even my daughter like she knows when we're uh when we're at home she eats whatever the heck she wants and she's in school she eats like whatever everybody else is eating and we do our best but like when we're in the forest and we're gone for walks or we're picking medicine she eats those little meat fat cakes like brownies uh just they're the greatest thing for for when you're on the road i'm sure i could take could just take a small little bag and i have all of the food i need for 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 like almost a week yeah this is amazing but, stuff, man. And I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Do you have another five minutes or so? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask you as we move towards the end of the conversation. So so a lot of my I, I come from like um I come from a movement that's like in solidarity with, with indigenous people's rights, but also talking about like environmentalism and, and many other things as well. And many of the my my comrades are talking about like veganism as a way to save the planet. And um, even when I was vegan, which is way back in the day, I, I didn't buy that. Um, but I, I buy it even less now. So what would you say to people like like George Mombay or these kind of people who are saying, you know, you got to we have to push veganism as a way to preserve um, forests and so on? What would you say to that? Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a uh, um there's a cost. And I always tell everybody like if I I have a there's a farm just by Peterborough and um 
if I get, if I just, just me, not my family, if I get one cow, actually it probably would extend almost to, almost to them as well. But one cow, I have everything that I, that's enough meat for me to have for the whole year. I get that at less than five bucks a pound too. And the farm in particular is a regenerative agriculture farm. And so they're building soil and they're sequestering a certain amount of carbon from the atmosphere uh, every year. And so there was, he is responsible, he and a bunch of other regenerative egg farms that are here are responsible for healing the environment. Like uh, he has, a, he took over like a old monocrop egg um, uh, cornfield and it's now pasture and the soil is increasing every single year and he's sequestering a massive amount of carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, so I'm supporting something that's that's great for the environment. And, you know, like everybody always wants to yell about methane without ever considering that methane is a part of a cycle and and it's not just going up and then that's it. Um, and and the grass that the cows are able to um, stimulate the growth of is very responsible for the methane sequestration. Uh, but anyways, um, I get one cow, one animal for the entire year. That's all I need. Um, and that's that's all I ever have. And some weeks are crappier than others because I don't know, maybe don't have my favorite cuts of meat, but I just get one animal for the entire year and that's it. I've killed one one thing uh, and have helped many things to be able to grow. Uh, and when you go to his farm, it's one of the most beautiful things. Yeah, uh, um, we're in a really good relationship between me and the and the farmer. And I understand the really privileged place that that comes from. But I kill one animal a year, and and I know that that animal was responsible for uh, healing the environment that it was growing in uh, from something that was really devastated, something that was you know monocrop egg, uh, yeah. growing a bunch of uh, grains and things for ethanol production mainly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that uh, we do have a responsibility. And I think, and I did like real simple calculations for Ontario because everybody's coming at me with the environmental stuff. And, uh, you know, if you took all of the monocrop agriculture farms that exist in Ontario, like it's it's mostly corn to make ethanol. Um, and then the byproduct is given to some cows to fatten them up. Uh, but um, you take all the corn, take all the canola, Canola oil, I just re learned recently, my buddy Junaid says, um, it stands for Canada Oil. <laughs> We're That's the correct. largest producer of canola oil in the world. Well, you're also where it was developed. invented, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, you convert all of these monocrop agriculture farms into regenerative agriculture livestock raising farms. Um, in Ontario, you would be able to easily, and this was a very, very generous um, uh, with my calculations, to be able to have all of Ontario go, uh, or sorry, 85% of Ontario to go completely carnivore. <laughs> if they were raising regenerative agriculture farms, there would be enough meat production in Ontario to feed 85% of Ontario. And the reason why there's lots of other parts of Ontario you cannot grow cows is because it's it's not flat enough. And and so on there, you know, you have all of the wild meat. I come from Manitoulin Island. There's almost 9,000 white-tailed deer that are harvested on Manitoulin Island every year. Uh, and the and the amount of moose tags that are give that are fulfilled, um, not even just poached or indigenous harvest. On top of that, I mean, you could easily supplement an 85% fully carnivorous community, yeah. that being Ontario, with wild meat, with um, sheep and goats sure. and yeah. chickens and like all yeah. the other stuff no yeah, that's well like, said yeah for me i, I yeah. don't want to get lost into like i think all these numbers you said are important but i also think that the principle is, is important and the principle is that we are we as humans are animals and we are part of natural systems and we played a role in those natural systems and there's nothing wrong with the role that we played we're not we're not we're not evil because of the food we eat right um, yeah. Just like the the wolf is not evil, evil the the eagle is not evil. They they're just part of nature, um, and so I, I I'm trying to get people to understand a more holistic uh, view of ecosystems when they talk about conservation and all these kind of things. Yeah, for sure, and it's a it's a really fun uh, conversation that I have uh, just with our family, just with my wife, and uh, she gets real mad every time she touches my phone because I got this picture. Uh, follow this um, uh, this page on Instagram. Uh, I think it's like it's called Nature is Metal. 
I think. Nice. Uh, they're they're pretty. It's pretty. It's pretty crazy. Most of their stuff, it's like grayed out because it's graphic or whatever. Okay. And like the 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 back screen on my phone okay. is uh is this like yeah, yeah. leopard and he's carrying a monkey, but obviously the the baby is still attached to the parent. Mother. Monkey. No, it's, it's it's brutal stuff. I mean, it, this is. So I, I have the, had the privilege, and it is a privilege, of watching a leopard kill here in, in South Africa. Um, but what I saw was the mother being... So I, I saw the mother... I was in a Jeep. Actually, it was a funny story. We were looking at a hippo across the river. When the hippo was outside, he was supposed to be in the river. We were wondering what the hell's going on. Then in front of us comes a, a deer and being chased by the leopard. Leopard takes down the deer and takes it away. Leopards are very picky about where they eat. Now, the problem was... The baby deer comes after, and uh, we didn't see that kill, but that kill happened for sure. That's, that's how nature works, right? Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Even for me, when I'm hunting, like I, I remember, um, you, you know, it, it just it seems. Uh, I don't know. I think uh, the the process of hunting is such an incredible experience, um, and yeah, you know, it's not always good. Sometimes it's. Sometimes it's a really good experience. It's just like wham, bam, and then that's it. Uh, but um, you have to be super keen and calculated. I remember one year we didn't get our moose. It was like the end of December, just super, super late for uh, going hunting. But there we were, you know, we needed it. And so um, we, uh, me and my dad, it was real funny. We got out the truck and because there was a moose standing in, in, in just this one narrow corridor. And so we uh, both at the same time, uh, kind of, I think we even almost counted down, but we shot at the same time. And then uh, uh, I have, uh, I'm left-handed, so I had to reload like awkward before I could bring it back up. And, but my dad, he, he's just running back to the car to go and text everybody that we got one. And because it's an incredible amount of work, we need help. Uh, but um, I, I went and I looked and then the moose was still standing there. So I was like, oh, so I shot it again and then I reloaded and then I looked back and it was still there. So I shot it again. And then I was yelling at my dad, like, it's not even dead yet. So then I uh, I, I went to go and uh, waited an hour or so. And then I went over there to go and uh, see what's up. I had one bullet left and then I saw the snow um the snow was moving like this and that, so that moose the nerves that it has after it dies it Same. buried itself and so wow. the snow was going like this so i thought oh there's a moose here but then i could hear crashing on this side and then i could see tracks running away and then you could tell in the tracks that it's limping i couldn't see blood but it couldn't there was snow it would have been easy to see the blood but i could see that it was limping and then i seen that moose running down the hill and it and it was limping so i thought oh um, this one, oh no, I had two bullets left. Yeah, sorry. Uh, but um, yeah, and yeah, I finished that one off and then it fell right away. And then um, I could hear spraying sounds. And then I, I looked and the, um, the two moose that, that the one that was under the snow was really light brown. So it was very young. The one running down the hill was light brown as well. It was very young. Uh, and so I, so I knew there was two young, young ones that, that were dead. And I had this time, I had one bullet left and then I looked and then that was the mom and the mom was breathing and she was just spraying blood out of her nose. Oh, no. And so I had me and my dad, we hit one moose and then we, another one walked out and then I hit that one and yeah, another yeah. one walked out and I hit yeah. that one. I get and it. I get it. One of them was the mom and she was there and, and, uh, uh, the the moment because I know like she just watched both of her kids you know uh, so I I stood there and it's a freaking moose they're so big it was like ten feet away it was like uh, you know one lunge and one kick and I'd probably die that's how they kill wolves all the time and I'm not as bulky as a wolf but um, we I just stood there and it was almost like we had a, like a energy exchange like we had a little conversation um and uh um it was an amazing experience and realization that that uh even hunting you know it's not uh um weird example but it's not like a sport no no <laughs> it, it's a it's an experience and 
And when I, uh, um, that moment that we had to be able to share with each other, when I, when I finally um, killed her, and then I was standing there in front of those three moose, um, my uncle came and he came with his whole family. And I was thinking about my whole family. And I was thinking about these were moose. They were doing everything that they've ever wanted their whole lives. They were wild. Uh, well, they fed us successfully for almost two and a half years. That's we were amazing. still eating those. Yeah. And so uh, that experience, how long that that goes from, from one to the other. And then you imagine like yeah. a mammoth, something we did for 340,000 years, that experience of having a mammoth and how long that that one life provided for us. Yeah, uh, no, it's amazing stuff. Really the the communities that I work with in in S Southern Africa, they, they 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 only hunt. They they are called hunter gatherer communities by by anthropologists and so on. But when you talk to them, they only really go on a hunt when they get. Basically, they have a dream, and they'll they'll dream that an animal is waiting for them someplace, um, and and it always is. Like uh, I being a stupid idiot, you know, um, I was like, okay, I, I want to go and see the animals and I want to sort of be part of a hunt or something. And they were like, you can go, but you're not going to see anything. Um, and sure enough, I, I tried to see stuff. I couldn't see it. Um, but when they go, they go because they feel the, the spirit of the animal calling to them. Um, and only then they do it. And only then is it done. And, and they're very, they're very like, what's the word? Very like stubborn about it like like you can't like because they're always in conflict with the local authorities and so on like local authorities are like you, sh you can't kill now and they're like no this is the time like we're being told that this is the time wow. it's not not about you it's about it's about the animal right that's super cool yeah oh, well joseph uh, yeah joseph it's been a real pleasure i hope we can um, continue this conversation at some point yeah yeah, for sure. That was, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed being able to chat to you about all these things. Thanks for listening to my discussion with Joseph Pitawanaquat. For more content like this, please do check out my website, samirdosani.net. There's also a link below in the description where you can book a free health consultation. With that, I'm Samir and I'm a health coach and PhD student based in South Africa. I'll see you next time.